All right. Welcome. Uh, my name is Andrew. Uh, this is Alan. Uh, we're here to talk about IPv6. Um, cool. The remote works. Um, so, going to talk about a couple different things. Uh, I'm going to start off by talking about the state of IPv6 on the internet. Uh, I'm going to give an overview of uh, IPv6, kind of what it is, what the protocol is, how it works a little bit. Uh, and then I'm going to hand off to Alan, who's going to talk about uh, an overview of IPv6 at AWS. So let's start talking about the state of IPv6 on the internet. So uh, this data is as of uh, you know, about a couple weeks ago. Uh, globally, we see about 13% of all users have IPv6 connectivity. This is measured based on users that are uh, able to reach a number of popular websites um, and, and kind of measuring what percentage of them have IPv6 reachability. In the US, that's about 30%. And you can see from the chart, um, it, it's basically doubling year over year, and it's been on the doubling year over year curve for uh, a number of years now. So that, that growth really is uh, uh, exploding uh, quite heavily. Uh, that growth is driven uh, by a handful of hotspots. So I'm picking, uh, calling out a few of these, uh, these ISPs where they're really seeing a lot of adoption. Um, a lot of thanks go to them too. Um, so you can see a couple of them like Comcast and AT&T of about 50% of their users have V6, and then a couple uh, with even higher like T-Mobile, Verizon, and British Sky Broadcasting at about 75% of their users having the ability to access V6 natively onto the internet. Um, so that's uh, pretty, pretty cool for those guys. Uh, now, broadly speaking, um, all the popular operating systems uh, have IPv6 support uh, available and enabled and ready to go. Uh, you know, Windows, Mac OS, Linux, uh, it's, it's been there for uh, actually a number of years. It's been turned on for a number of years um, in software, you know, uh, web browsers, client libraries. Generally speaking, we'll, we'll do the right things if they're given the opportunity to connect over IPv6. So next I want to transition to an overview of IPv6 and just, just provide some high level information about uh, how it works and what's different uh, compared to IPv4. Um, so the most common one that I think most people know about is bigger addresses. So who here did not know there's 128-bit V6 address? I shouldn't pick on you not knowing it. That guy didn't. He did. He's lying. Uh, that's okay. Bigger addresses. Um, and, and these addresses, you know, 128 bits is four times bigger than 32 bits that you get with, uh, with, with V4. Um, but it's not that V6 is four times bigger, it's way bigger because these are exponents, right? So V4 is two to the 32 uh, addresses, V6 is two to the 128, so much, much bigger. Um, and I want to give you a sense of scale of that. Um, so uh, this is a big jet. This is a 767-300. Uh, it's a wide-body jet that Amazon's using to deliver packages. Uh, so I want to fill this thing with IPv4 addresses. Uh, so I need something to represent an IPv4 address. and. Uh, I did a little math, and it turns out about a ladybug is about an IPv4 address in this world, and Amazon actually sells live ladybugs. I'm not entirely sure, but I think it's for gardening. Um, so if we use this ladybug and load up that 767 to its maximum landing weight, you wind up with about 4.3 billion ladybugs that would fit in it, uh, which conveniently happens to be the number of IPv4 addresses. If you then use that same ladybug to say, all right, let's say, say that ladybug is an IPv6 address, you know, how much space do we need to represent uh, all of the IPv6 space? Um, so this is Earth, the little blue dot you see there. Um, that is to scale the yellow thing in the corner is the sun. Um, so if we continue using that uh, one ladybug equals one IPv6 address, we need a swarm of ladybugs the size of about 2,200 Earth suns. Uh, so considerably bigger space uh, in, the, in the V6 world. Um, now, there are some similarities uh, with v6 and v4. Um, we still have CIDR notation, so if you're used to IP slash uh, prefix length, uh, that, that continues to be the case. Uh, TCP, UDP, and ICMP are relatively unchanged if you're familiar with those in v4. The same basic concept applies in v6. But there are some differences. Uh, addresses are written a bit differently. Uh, we don't have NAT in v6, and I'll talk a bit about that. There's a lot of other littler stuff that I could go on to wax poetic about on some details. Um, it's not super interesting, but there's some differences in terms of like L2 neighbor discovery and uh, DHCP and some things like that. So to talk about uh, IPv6 address format, uh, IPv6 does not use the dotted quad notation that you get with IPv4 of number, dot number, dot number, dot number. Instead, we use the uh, easy to say uh, colon separated hexadecimal quads. Uh, so uh, as you can see from the address example I gave here, 
Uh, we've got a group of four hexadecimal characters, so you'll see letters showing up. Uh, they're separated by colons. And then you also see, <clears throat> in this example, the colon colon, which is a shortcut notation to represent a long string of zeros. So if this address were written out in full, there'd be 16 of those little quads, uh, with most of them in this example being zero. So it's in a way to abbreviate. Uh, and if you kind of think through that one for a little bit, you might realize that uh, you can only have one of those colon colons in an address since you wouldn't know otherwise how, how big or small they are. So you can only have one shortcut colon colon. I mentioned there's no NAT in v6, and this is probably one of the biggest uh, differences versus v4. Uh, IPv6 takes an end-to-end -end philosophy on the internet, wanting, you know, wanting the ability to have any host on the internet able to uh, reach other hosts. Um, the thinking here is security should rely on firewalls and not on hiding uh, your infrastructure, and that everything should be globally reachable. That guy's taking a picture. We'll give him a second. So to take a brief aside, why do we NAT IPv4? And the real answer is we ran out of addresses. We ran out of addresses, I don't know, 15 years ago. But it's nice, right? It kind of hides your internal stuff behind the NAT, kind of like that. Um, but it has some pain. Um, you know, you wind up with these private networks and, you know, two people create a private network and then they want to peer their networks together and they overlap. Um, and that, that's not fun to deal with. Uh, if you're managing DNS, it's pretty common to do a split horizon DNS where you get one private IP if you request the DNS internally and a different IP if you request externally. And it's kind of hard to configure, difficult to manage. Um, and it's caused a number of applications to break over the years. Um, FTP is a really common one, but a bunch of like chat applications that try to go peer to peer have to do a whole bunch of heroics to work around, uh, work around uh, NAT and IPv4. <coughs> so, why not NAT IPv6? Well, it's kind of the opposite reason of why NAT v4. We've got plenty of address space. Um, you know, hiding your stuff isn't really security. It does give you some privacy. Um, but having everything in one big flat global network solves a bunch of problems. You don't have problems with address overlap. Uh, you don't have to think about split horizon DNS. It's the same address inside and out. Um, and you don't have to work around uh, the, the trickery of, of an application not knowing what its actual public IP address is. It's a flat address space. So you might be thinking, you're telling me my hosts are going to have a public address, even my, my backend stuff, and they're going to be out there on the internet, and I kind of feel naked. Well, I kind of have to ask the question, you know, do you feel more naked than when you have a public IPv4 address on them? It's really the same thing. So I might have just bored you a little bit, so let's jump to a pop quiz. So for the audience, pop quiz, can an IPv4 only host directly access an IPv6 only host? And feel free to shout out an answer. I'm seeing some head shaking no, and that is the correct answer. So no, they can't. So let's, let's walk through some examples of, of how this works. So here's an example of a user who has only IPv4 connectivity. They're connecting to my favorite website that has only IPv4 connectivity, um, and they, they want to try to access this. Uh, so the first thing they're going to do is they're going to do a DNS lookup. They're going to ask for an A record for, in this case, www.amazon.com. The DNS server will reply with the IP address, and then they can go ahead and open their socket. That's great. That's what they've been doing for years. So. It gets a little more tricky once you have both uh, v4 and v6, or when you want to live in both worlds. And so here's an example, or what that's called is dual stack, and here's an example of, of a host that, that's configured for dual stack. And basically, dual stack says, why not have both? Have both a v4 address and a v6 address. And so to use this example, so here is netflix.com. Uh, they are dual stack, they have both v4 and v6 connectivity. But in this case, the user has only a v4 address. So let's see how this works. So in this case, User says, hey, I'd, I'd like to connect. They ask for an A record for uh, Netflix.com. Their DNS server responds with an IP address. And just like before, they open up a socket and they're good. In this case, this user who has only IPv4 doesn't even care about the IPv6 connectivity. And their stuff just continues to work like it did for a long time. Then we get into a true, du a true dual stack case. And this is a little bit more interesting. So here is a user who has both IPv4 and IPv6 and a website that has both IPv4 and IPv6. And so this behaves a little bit differently. So now the user uh, is going to ask for both an A record for Netflix and a quad A record. Uh, the quad A is uh, a really bad DNS joke. The addresses are four times longer, so there's four times as many A's. And that's as good as DNS jokes get. <laughs> so they ask for both the A record and the quad A record, and they get back a response for both of those in this case. And now it gets interesting. How, how, does this, how do you choose? You, know, you can go either way. You can go left or right. So you have this option to kind of pick. 
Now, fortunately, there's an RFC that defines this, RFC 6724. If you're wondering what the name of that is, it, uh, it is uh, IPv6 source address selection. And if you're wondering, yes, it totally influences which destination you go to for IPv4 or IPv6. It's very poorly named. Uh, the key takeaway, though, from the RFC is basically given the choice of v4 or v6, in most cases, v6 will be preferred over v4. Um, so the client totally gets to pick. So if you're the website in this case, you don't control whether they go over v4 or v6. It's up to the client to make that decision of which one they'd prefer to do. So in this case, the client is going to prefer to go over IPv6 uh, and connect to the, to the website that way. So now I'm going to hand off to Alan, who's going to talk about IPv6 at AWS. Thank you. All right, good afternoon, everybody. So IPv6 uh, at AWS. So uh, one of the first services that uh, we launched with IPv6 accessibility was our uh, IoT service. So if you have things talking to Amazon's uh, data plane for the IoT service, you are getting back IPv6 addresses as uh, part of the endpoint addressing. And we'll see if this actually works. Yes, you can see you've got them stacked top and bottom. And uh, just note the name as well. Um, at the, on the name, you'll also see right here it says dual stack. And so you'll start to see that uh, as a trend in the rest of the conversation here. So IoT uh, device gateways. IPv6 enabled for a little bit of time now. Uh, there was an announcement about S3 recently as well. So S3 is now also accessible uh, over IPv6. To do that, you stick the word dual stack in uh, the FQDN in the appropriate spot. And the return address on the DNS um, is both v4 and v6 addresses. Here I'm showing you that I'm doing a wget forcing the IPv6 path. and um, you know, I have no, uh, no particular issues pulling uh, data down. I, I do want to point out right here that I have uh, 32 seconds to point out, pull down this particular file, which is material for the next thing I'm going to show, which is S3 transfer acceleration. S3 transfer acceleration is fundamentally a use of our edge network, CloudFront, to facilitate communication with S3. So you can see that both CloudFront is supporting uh, IPv6 addresses. Again, um, I'm having to be particular in the URL that I'm using so that I have defined dual stack. Um, but yeah, verily, IPv6 addresses come back, uh, the get succeeds, and notice here it's happening in eight seconds. So in about a quarter of the time, uh, S3 transfer acceleration has pulled down the file. So CloudFront does support IPv6. It's what's being used for S3 transfer acceleration. To turn it on, if you have an existing distribution, there's a checkbox. If you are deploying a new distribution, it'll be checked for you by default. Now, things to be aware of, and this is, some of this is not specific to CloudFront. If you have IAM conditions that care about IP addresses and you're turning on IPv6, you need to be aware of that or you're going to start denying people by accident. If you have scripts that parse IP addresses out of log files, you need to be aware of that. If you're expecting to see IPv6 addresses coming in over CloudFront, well, that IPv6 address is going to come in on the X forwarded for header, and so you need to be able to parse that. So here is a distribution that I've set up. That distribution is dual stack. And then if I take a look, what I see from the client perspective, I'm getting my address back in this, uh, in this browser. What's behind this browser in EC2 is an instance that's running a little program that's reading the X forwarded for header and echoing it back to the screen. So to CloudFront, I'm talking IPv6. From CloudFront to EC2, I'm talking IPv4. The X forwarded for header has the originating v6 address. Now, our edge network's enabled for IPv6, which means that I can also put IPv6 into the Amazon Web Application Firewall or Amazon WAF. So if I take my same source address, put in a matching rule that says deny access, go back to the same URL, and I get a request blocked. So our edge services are capable of both uh, understanding and then passing backwards uh, information about incoming clients that are using v6 as the transport. Route 53. So Route 53 has supported quad A records for quite a while. Um, predates my time at Amazon. Um, so that is, uh, that's not news. What is news is that Route 53 now has the ability to resolve over IPv6. Also a recent launch, 
So with Route 53, you can um, use IPv6 as the transport to get DNS resolution. And here you can see that I've done that um, by forcing my host lookup to use v6. Now, Route 53 also supports, uh, as folks know, aliases. So I can take an EC2 instance or really any of my records that are in my, uh, my resource record set for my hosted zone, and I can um, use aliasing to return information instead of doing CNames and things like that. So what I've done here is on that same instance that I showed you earlier, um, I have changed the code slightly so that it's returning the incoming IP address. So it's not doing an X484. This is direct access to the system. If you take a look at the URL, this is a URL that's being uh, served out by Route 53. Now, if you're also paying attention, you'll notice that right here, this is an EC2 instance, and my log file is showing the client coming from an IPv6 address. So if you're paying close attention to the screen, or you've seen our blog, then you know that today we announced a native IPv6 service for a virtual private cloud. So this is what the console looks like, just a little snippet for the EC2 instance. Uh, you can see I've got a little IPv6 addresses section right here. Um, the launch is so new that I had to get the screenshot from the development team. So um, the way that v6 will work in VPC, largely the same way that you would expect things to work in the v4 land with uh, kind of following differences. When you create a VPC, Amazon will allocate to you from its globally unique address space a slash 56. That will be assigned to your VPC. When you create subnets, your subnets will have a slash 64. Two things about that. One, you can turn this on or off. You want to add v6 to your VPC, great. You can turn it on. You want to add it to a subnet, great. You can associate it. The slash 56 and the slash 64 are fixed. And just keep in mind, for those that are concerned about not being able to resize your subnets, slash 64 address space is still orders of magnitude larger than the current IPv4 address space. So we don't think people will need to resize. We also have introduced something called an, um, an egress-only internet gateway, EIGW. So Andrew talked earlier about NAT and how some customers like NAT from the perspective of it creates, if you will, a one-way pipe out to the internet. Traffic can't come from the internet in through the NAT. It needs to be originated internally, and it's a stateful uh, representation of the connection. The EIGW allows you to do the same thing with IPv6. All of your instances will have publicly addressable IP addresses, but for your private subnets, you can route your default route through an uh, egress-only internet gateway, and internal traffic from your VPC can go out, but folks on the internet using IPv6 as a transport are unable to come into your instance, certainly not from the perspective of initiating traffic towards you. All the other trappings are there. Security groups work the way you would think they do, support v6. Network access control lists work the way you think they would do. Same with internet gateway. So you can have a colon colon zero route, colon colon zero slash zero, colon colon slash zero route uh, towards an IGW. And uh, we're also co-launching with VPC direct connect support. So as of today, direct connect also supports IPv6. We'll have some fast followers um, in terms of other services that you would expect, uh, elastic load balancing, et cetera. And I think you'll see those coming soon. This launched today in US East 2 with other regions also coming soon to you. And I think that is the sum total of kind of the prepared remarks, if you will. Um, but we expect there are going to be a lot of questions. And so what I'd like to suggest is Andrew and I will kind of come off the stage and formally kind of finish the presentation and answer any questions that you folks have. Thank you. <laughs>